Here's part two of our conversation with Canadian music legend Marie McLaughlin. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Canada. I mean, you know, as all the rock stars are dying, I mean, I know they're all at that age, and I try to. I, I, people laugh at me because because most of my my videos that I do are tributes to uh, to rock stars who have just passed away, and mm -hmm. you know, I look at even me at fifty seven. I look at me and I'm going. You know, shit could happen at any time. I mean, it's just at that age. Keep busy. But I, I, I when I read about your trip to Italy, I'm going and, and and reading, you know, some of your lyrics where you're going making every day count, and and I thought that seems conscious with you. That seems conscious that you know what I'm not. This is a sec as one of your songs said, second part of life. Um, you you know you've got time left. You don't know, but but there's you're going to make the best of what you got. Correct. Correct. But notwithstanding the fact that, you know, should a block of lavatory ice fall off a plane over my head and kill me where I sit, I've explained this to my 90-year-old mother-in-law who occasionally gets a little bit morbid because for her, time is very short, that, you know, when death comes for you, it can come when you're 15, or it can come when you're 20. It can come in a war. It can come in a traffic accident. It can come by getting cancer. It can come in any way at any time in your life, and that her chances of outliving me were just about as good as my outliving her. And that's what makes the moment precious because you don't know, and you don't want to know. You don't want to know. The fact is that you know I've hit most of the – if I had markers that I wanted to hit in my life, I have. I've done most everything. I've really been fortunate to do most everything that I, that I wanted to do and experience most everything that I wanted to experience. So, you know, if I if the lavatory eyes fell on my head, please no. But you know, I wouldn't regret the the amount of life that I've had or what I've been able to pack into it. And I've left a you know a a really terrific uh, pair of kids. Like they're very bright and they're wonderful kids. So, you know, I've I've done my job. I have spawned, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I mean, I think I've left something behind that may be of some value. That's you know, for a period of time. You know, I'm I'm very conscious of that old poem that you might recollect, where the punchline in the poem. It's it it concerns an explorer who's wandering through the desert and he comes on an old statue that's half buried in the sand and broken up and and he reads the inscription and it says uh, I'm Osman Dias, King of Kings. Behold my works, ye mighty and despair. <laughs> so it kind of puts it in perspective. Yeah, yeah. With the new album, you know, I and I know your music really well. I'm a fan. I saw you in Edmonton uh, when I lived there, but I there there's something about the new album to me. Is it here's this guy who has learned his lessons? I mean, you you know the business more than anybody else. You've rubbed shoulders with some of the big guys. You ended up being one of the big guys in this country. Um, it's almost like you're sharing the wealth on on this album. Before we get to songs that you love playing, which I uh, that's a whole other thing, but it's almost like you're sharing the wealth because your stories have a lot of wisdom in them uh, on this album. Tell me about the process of putting this together. There's um, sort of two different types of song material on the record. Three, obviously, people would recognize as standards. Mm -hmm. They're um, songs like um, that I was exposed to when I was coming up as a as a kid. In some cases, um, the radio of my youth, when I was before my teen years, what I'd be listening to at night was very, very eclectic. In those days, music wasn't siloed like it is now. You didn't have country stations. You didn't have rock, urban. You didn't have all these subcategories of music that were like political parties. You either, you're in that or you're not in that, or you're in this or you're not that, or you know, people didn't wear it like a shirt. So as a result, you know, I, I could hear uh, Guy Mitchell singing Green Door back to back with Patsy Cline, back to back with the champs doing tequila back to back with in this case a rosemary clooney song from a musical called pajama game uh, which was called hey there and it's a song that's it's found its way into my heart more in my later years because like many men uh way back in the distant past i fell disastrously and stupidly in love and it was not requited 
And so for me, that song is kind of like a shout back down through the halls of time to my, you know, late twenty-year-old self, going, "Oh, oh, brother, just think twice here." So there's that. There's uh, standards like um, "Come Fly with Me," which is, you know, I've like Joni Mitchell. You know, I've looked at clouds from both sides now, but for real, um, you know, as an aviator, that's like that's my tune. Um, so you know, there's that there's that set of of tunes, and you know, the really uplifting. What's an old Jerome Kern song called uh, "Pick Pick Pick Yourself Up," which uh, you know, I kind of bang away to myself whenever I'm feeling kind of down. I always have. I've always loved that song. So there are songs that attach themselves to me in some way. There's there's this thing that I got to interrupt you. There's this thing that I I, I as when I was a program director, I one day discovered. I thought, and I thought. This is a good song. Everyone's playing it, but how does it make you feel? And then I got went from there to listening to albums now and then and go, I bet you that musician loves playing that song. And eventually I'd get to talk to them. Half the time I was right. I'd go, you, that must be fun to play in concert. And that's something you've talked about with this album, that these are songs that you love to play. That's true. I mean, my core is that I, I've discovered again – for the second time around, that what I really love to do is play music. It's as simple as that. It's, uh, and what I love to do is, is, especially to do, is play music that has some, you know, it's a bit like an onion. Um, you have to peel back a lot of layers to get to the center of it. You know, the, the thing about the other songs uh, on the record, you know, the songs that are co-writes in some cases or that I wrote uh, with partners, uh, with by myself, excuse me, is that I went to school on why songs by people like, you know, lyricists like Sammy Kahn or, uh, you know, the simple, seemingly simple little ditties of Cole Porter, like why they work so well, why they wound up attaching themselves in so many cases to people and to me. So having gone to school on that kind of stuff, it was an easy get for me when I came uh, – I'll give you an example if – if you've got the patience, uh, my brother, he's the original Don Draper, um, Is you know, the, right? mad, the madman guy. Yeah, he yeah. was an advertising guy, seriously big, good advertising guy. And we got into a kind of a dare match, like songwriting, you know, how hard can it really be? You know, moon, June, frickin' spoon. And, uh, you know, I said, okay, so send me, send me some lyrics and we'll try and write something together for a laugh. So he sent me a lyric and, uh, you know, it sucked, but there was a kind of a core in there. Like what he sent me was a, one of the lines was, don't mess with my martini. I like it on the rocks, blah, blah, blah. And it just did not swing at all. It was just leaden in its poetry. So I went back to the well and I thought, okay, what would Sammy Khan do with this? Because Sammy Kahn's lyrics work a lot because he's a master of what we in the trade call ethnic inversion. In short, like when Sammy Kahn would write a line like, you know, my kind of town Chicago is like Sinatra would sing. Yeah. What he was really doing was writing like an old Jewish guy would sing, you know, my kind of town Chicago is. <laughs> so it's called an ethnic inversion. So I took my brother's line, don't mess with my martini, I like it on the rocks, and went, okay, what would Sammy do? And so I switched it around and went, my martini. Not a thing you should mess with. That, I and was going to ask you about that song. I was going to say, is that your son <laughs> as a co-write of that song? No, uh, my brother. Yes, yeah. my brother. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the songs that are on, you know, the ones that, that I either created or helped create are, are particularly special to me because they're really, you know, you have to have been around the block a bit, I think, to, to get them, particularly – you know, the title track that I wrote with a de really dear friend of mine who's unfortunately passed away. I was familiar recently. with her, yeah. Yeah, Allison was, you know, it, I take the word familiar advisedly because Allison was quite a gal. I mean, but, uh, you know, your name it never wound up on one of her tattoos. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, we talked a lot because, uh, you know, Allison had become the the other woman in a love triangle at you know in her well into her 60s and uh unlike so many folks who might be sort of 
guilty or feel like they're going to scandalize their you know their relatives she was quite chuffed she was extremely proud of the fact that she was the other woman for the you know for the first time in her life in a, in a triangle so we started kicking around this idea that you know love just doesn't happen to people that are the age of Romeo and Juliet. I mean, it happens in Chartwell residences uh, quite often, apparently. You know, the caveat, watch out what mom and dad are up to. Mm -hmm. um, so we started looking at that idea, and we came up with this, you know, that romantic love or falling in love is really a timeless experience. It could happen at any time in life, and it's nobody's purview. So, you know, this that song and several of the other ones, like Second Half of Life, are they're really quite life-affirming. And, uh, you know, when I looked back at the collection of songs, I mean, the thing that was most interesting to me is in the era of the great orange president from south of the border when everybody's running around with their hair on fire, I actually made a record that you can sit down and listen to and feel good for 45 minutes. More from Murray McLaughlin coming up next week. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. And buy a Rock History Canada t-shirt. Help support our channel. I'm John Bowden.